internet and welcome back to another episode of Meet La Prensa. Tonight's guest is Jasmine Ulloa from the Boston Globe, who I think is one of the best, most dynamic political reporters in the country today. She covers she covers a lot of immigration and border issues, which obviously are very important to us on the show. But she also had an incredible story this week where she went out to Kevin McCarthy's district in Bakersfield, California, to write about that. So we'll start tonight by asking her a little bit about her reporter reporting, and then we'll go into her Bakersfield reporting before asking her the questions that we always ask first-time guests why journalism, and who are the most underrated workers in the American newsroom. Viewer, if you find this helpful, make sure you like and subscribe. You can find Jasmine's Twitter handle in the description. Welcome, Jasmine, to Meet La Prensa. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for that nice introduction. Thank you so much. No, of course. So your latest reporting in the Boston Globe shows that Kamala Harris now has been has the monumental task, right, of digging in to the Latin American dynamic, the Latin American sort of geopolitical dynamic, and coming up with solutions for the new White House. Now, President Barack Obama, two presidencies ago, assigned his vice president, then Vice President Joe Biden, to handle the Latin American portfolio as well. What is going to happen differently this time? What are some of the lessons maybe that Joe Biden has learned by handling the, the, the what are some of the lessons that Joe Biden might have learned by handling the Latin American portfolio for the White House two presidencies ago that now Kamala Harris can kind of benefit from now that she's been tasked with doing the same as his vice president. Yeah, so she's, um, it, it's good that you said that, 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 that he, you know, she's taking on this role that he previously had. Um, and it's, it's, it's good because he, there's a roadmap there, right? You know, the, he, she's not starting from a completely, um, you know, fresh slate. Uh, so there are there are proven strategies there, but the 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 landscape looks completely different. It is just a much more. Uh, it was already a mammoth task fraught with geopolitical uh, complexity, and it's even harder now because of, of uh, conditions have just deteriorated. I was talking to um, foreign policy experts and Latin American experts, you know, all this week and last week about. Um, just uh, how 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 much how much more difficult this task is going to be? Uh, corruption is 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 just a, a much um, a harder problem for her to take on. You know, Biden had some an, anointed partners. It wasn't it wasn't completely easy uh, working with with government officials in uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, in um, in El Salvador, Guatemala, in Honduras. But n now those relationships are, are just no longer there. And there's, you know, there's, there's questions about who she will be able to work with. I think what I heard a lot from, from people who have been following the issue for a really long time um, and, and are very eager to work with Kamala Harris on this, uh, they say, you know, you have to really look at civil society. Who are the activists? Who are the independent actors, the, the, the independent freelancers? Who are the prosecutors? Who are the judges um, who are trying to, to make a more inclusive, more just society? Those are going to be your partners moving forward. And you have to take, um, she's going to have to take a much, um, a much closer partnership uh, with, with, this, with this section than, than Biden did. So... What are your sources telling you are the biggest challenges and opportunities in the region for the vice president's office to take on? Uh, I mean, the, de the at the at the core of it is the deter deterioration of the rule of law, and so she, um, you know, that's why she doesn't have the foreign policy credentials that Biden did, but she does have, you know, she was a former prosecutor. She was California's top prosecutor, and so so people believe she she knows what's at the core of this issue uh, in a way that no one else does. So if, if she leans on those instincts, I think she'll, uh, from what I heard from sources is that, you know, she's, she's going to be able to handle, to, to be able to handle this and any progress, any incremental progress that she can make on, on such a complex problem could, could be seen as a, as a, as a, as a, um, as a boon to her, to her per portfolio. Jasmine, what would you say to somebody who says, isn't this just the president layering a problem away from himself? Uh, you know, it, it, Biden has taken a look at the region. He's, he sees that this border story is something that's really come to define the first year of his presidency. And now he's saying, I need to create some layers between me and it because I'm not going to be able to deliver. Is that something that's a legitimate criticism or is it something that, you know, like, is, or is this more sort of the normal course of affairs in the president's portfolio? Because obviously we're talking about him taking the Latin America portfolio and putting it on his subordinate, right? 
we're not talking about him taking the European portfolio or the Australian portfolio or the Russian portfolio and putting it on his subordinate. Is Latin America being cast by the wayside? Well, I mean, Obama did the same thing to, to him. So he's kind of, he has a pattern to follow. Um, and I, I just lost my train of thought. No, no. <laughs> on, um, what was I going to say about that? Um, is Latin America being cast by the wayside in this maneuver by the president? Because in the org chart now, you know, obviously well, we have State Department, we have all these different places, all these different agencies that work in Latin America. But now Biden's saying, y'all got to report to, to, to Vice President Harris. You know, like, I don't want to hear about it, <laughs> except for from her. <laughs> well, I mean, she's and she's not the, the first the first vice president to be handed such a such a thorny task. You know, Trump also handed the whole coronavirus pandemic response to Mike to Mike Pence. Um, so I, I don't, Fair. I, so I don't think that, that, that they would, obviously they wouldn't characterize it that way. And she's, this is one of, uh, several big items on her portfolio on, on her, on her, um, this is one of several big items on her, um, list of things to do of her, yeah. of like her big tasks. And, and I think that that's why her, 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 um, staff is also kind of pushing back. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, she's not going to be handling, uh, making sure that kids at the border, um, are, are not sleeping on the floor or are not in, are not in these overcrowded conditions. That's going to be a task. So it is like, it is, it, she's, she's going to be getting heat from all sides. She's going to be getting heat from Republicans on, 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 they're going to be trying to blame her for everything that happens at the border. And that's why I think her staff is kind of pushing back. Like, no, she's going to be, uh, handling, these root causes of migration, what is driving migration, but in a way like that, like you said, this is just, this is an even harder task. But if she's able, like I said, if she's able to do even um, a minimal, like an incremental incremental progress and, and be able to show that it, 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 it could benefit her politically. So a lot of people have been sounding the alarm about the border, in particular, the Department of Homeland Security. And obviously now the Vice President's office via with the president's authority is sounding the alarm about Latin America. These are all agencies. These are all entities within the federal government that are going to be going for budget before Congress soon. How seriously should we take the data coming out of the government and some of these uh, sort of these these cries, these call to actions, if you will, from the government when at the end of the day they do seem kind of conflicted? Like, who are there any independent agencies that you can rely on as a journalist? to say, listen, we need to make sure that these numbers are right and we're not just elevating the government's claim that there's a crisis. Yeah, I mean, the Government Office of Accountability, the Inspector Office, the, the Inspector General's uh, reports on that. Um, and then also, you know, there there are some just just uh, cross-checking, cross cross-referencing with what activists and uh, immigrant, immigrant rights groups who have been working on this for a long time. I, I think it's always important to kind of look at the various various sources when are you when, seeing uh, are you seeing any divergences between what the government's telling you and what your immigration sources are telling you because i know that during the trump presidency there were the divergencies couldn't been more 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 you know sort of more profound like between what the trump people were the, the, what the white house what the past white house was saying is the truth and what immigrants not just at the border but around the region were saying is the truth yeah you know and i was i i covered state politics for the los angeles times but i did a brief stint in washington in the middle like i was thrust just flown into washington right before the the separations uh not the separations have been happening for like a, a year right in, in this formal policy but it, right in the summer right when it when it hit um when it became like an international uh, headline, you know, an internet caused sparked an international outrage. So, um, and I remember trying to track down the numbers then and just how difficult it was to get any sense, like any, any number was difficult. Like they would send you to one agency and that person would send you to another agency. And it, it was just like, it was like pulling teeth. It's not, I don't think it's that way anymore so far. Um, it, it seems more streamlined now than it's, it's, it was. <laughs> yes, and at least the, and at least people are trying to give you information. Right. So it, yeah, found, it, it's a different experience. We, we found the same inefficiencies during the Trump times. If you weren't connected to the president or one of his relatives, then it was hard to get an answer that was legit from anybody. And so, was, I mean, I find it refreshing now. Obviously, it's not necessarily to take a a position one way or another on the new president, but. I think it's a lot more refreshing to get this information out there. But at the same time, it is important to question whether or not it's coming from, you know, 
people who are giving us actual numbers or people who are going for money. So Jasmine, far from the border, far from Latin America, far from Boston and far from Washington, D.C. is Bakersfield, California, where your reporting took you this week. Tell us, how did that come about? So I, like I said, I covered state politics in in, in California and I covered the, the midterm. So I, I was pretty familiar with, with Kevin McCarthy before I came to Boston. And I just thought that he was in a very interesting position in, in Congress trying to, uh, you know, well, we, as I, we, we've been looking into this question about the radicalization of the Republican Party, the, the battle for the, the soul of the party and where, uh, so, we, we, so we've been doing a series of stories just looking at that question and looking at the history and how we got here. Um, and we're looking, in, and as part of that, we're looking at who are the major players. And so that's how that story came about. We were just, um, you know, I, I, I thought that he was in an interesting position. I, uh, trying to corral members, trying, he, like I, I, I wrote in the story, he's, we saw some pretty spectacular contortions as to, you know, supporting um, the, the more far right uh, wing of his uh, elements in his party, but then also uh, standing by Liz Cheney. And so I, I was just, just trying to get a sense of, I was trying to, I went to Bakersfield trying to get a sense of who he was and what was motivating him. And uh, what you know? What role he was going to play in Congress and in, in, in this crucial moment for the Republican Party? Did you meet any Latinos in Bakersfield? Oh yes, of course, of course. <laughs> the reason I ask is because obviously Kevin McCarthy is trying to have it both ways right now by playing to the far reaches of the, the fringe of his party and to the Liz Cheney's of his party in an effort to try and be the party leader, leader McCarthy. But the question is, uh, I never hear of Latinos. You never hear of Latinos, and especially don't you? Know, you never hear of rural worker Latinos, which Bakersfield is known for. It's been known for since mice and men, Latinos working hard in the dust, right? So how is it that Kevin McCarthy can retain his district without any sort of hat tip whatsoever to Latinos? It's a California district. This is one of the questions that we have all the time for tech companies. It's like, how is it possible that you have 3% Latino workers at your tech company when you're living and when you're based and living in California? It's a question I basically also have for Kevin McCarthy. How on earth are you in charge? How on earth are you elected when you, it, from the looks of it, you well, don't actually have any Latino support? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and you have to understand like the dynamics of the Central Valley, like California is blue, but it we're, Cal, people know California as a blue state, but really it's a purple state, like any and like Texas, you know, where you have these rural areas that are more moderate, and even the people, Latinos in in the Central Valley are very, um, they're like ideologic. There's like they're they're very um, people like to say they're moderate, but there's been recent studies coming out of Texas looking at moderate Latinos, and it, and it's it's Latino voters. And what researchers are finding is that Latinos are actually more open to messages and more um, ideologically hybrid is, is what some of the words so, or, or what the, the phrase that is being used to to describe Latinos in Texas. And the way people describe the Central Valley is kind of think of Texas in, in California. <laughs> um, so so the, the Latino voter is, is very different compared to the rest of California. The Latino voter that you find there is different and, and, it, and Latinos don't vote. So it, it, I think that that's what you see there. Why, why he's a, why that the power resides in a more, you know, white uh, farmer, employer, you know, with, with that side and not with the worker with, with, you know, actually the people that are actually picking the crops. And that's like a long history of that in the Central Valley. And there's been, you know, the Chicano rights movement, there's, there's been community leaders that have tried to fight that, but that persistence that, that hasn't that hasn't been sustained. That that like movement building hasn't been sustained there. What are the challenges of sustaining a movement? What are I mean? When, so when you think of, I think that when a lot of people think of California, they think of movements. <laughs> they think of people who are advocating. People who march in the streets. When you go to May Day in Los Angeles, I mean, I, I mean, as a Washingtonian who's used to lots of protests, I go there and I'm like, oh my god, these people are awesome. They're really really into it. So what are the challenges? That what are the, what would be the challenges then? I guess like. If you were somebody who's upset about Kevin McCarthy's anti-immigrant, constant, persistent, consistent anti-immigrant posturing, 
Like, what are the challenges to organizing to remove him? Is it a very gerrymandered district, for example? Like, what's what's the issue there? Well, I mean, gerrymandering is a problem ac across the country. But yeah, I mean, that there's not that that same international intergenerational um, passage of knowledge. There's a lot of collective amnesia within a community. I mean, it's the same thing that you again, it's kind of the same kind of trends that you see in Texas. Like, why we why Texas hasn't seen a a, a Stacey Abrams, for example. Um, so I, I think it the 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 building the political bench, you know, building political leadership, building that pipeline isn't there. Um, and then again, just people people don't grow up voting or don't learn how to, how to, how to vote. And, and that's changed a lot in California because uh, pe uh, other, other consultants have come in and, and Latino leaders have come in from other places to help organize. And you saw that a lot in, in 2018. Um, that is why, um, you know, to the to the north of of Kevin McCarthy's district. So in in the Central Valley, it was it was really, it's been this um, it's been this giant question mark, right? Because the numbers favor Democrats in that area because Latino because the, the numbers of Latinos are so high and Latinos tend to be oh generally are are Democratic leaning, but yet all all the main um, representatives were Republican, have, have, you know, all those seats have long been held by Republicans. So you have David Valadeo, uh, Jeff Denham, uh, Devin Nunes, uh, and, and, and Kevin McCarthy. So, so those are like the four kind of like what people call as like the titans of the, of the central, central Valley. But Jeff Denham and David Valadeo were knocked out in the 2018 midterm because you had that kind of organization. So you had people like um, activists with Unite, Unite We Dream, uh, United We Dream, actually going in and knocking on doors and countering misinformation. Like there was a lot of misinformation about uh, Jeff Denham's challenger, Josh Harder, about abortion and that he was a baby killer. But like Latino activists would come in, Latino farm workers would come in and knock on doors. And I spent a lot of time with them doing that. Um, and and they, they, they like I'd see them counter like, actually, no, this is what he actually stands for. But it takes time. It takes a lot of time. How important is it being bilingual to cover the stories that you're covering? Oh, so I think it's super important. You just connect with people on a completely different level. So let me ask you, why journalism, Jasmine? Obviously, you're really awesome at this. You're on the front page of the Boston Globe all the time. What was it that inspired you to take up the craft? I mean, so like the well, how I like thought, oh, you know, I could be a journalist. Like, honestly, and this is embarrassing, is like looking at uh, I was watching telenovela, like watching a telenovela with my grandmother, and you know the the intrigues of telenovelas are always like the good guys, you know, like the the bad girl and the good girl and fighting over the guy. But uh, there was one where she was a new, there was a, a newsroom scene. I, I can't, I think, I think she was like a news newspaper reporter. Or the, the, the several of the characters were like newspaper reporters, and I was just like always way more intrigued by the newspaper scene, <laughs> the scenes, and and like just like that that collective move, like that movement to action and breaking the news and breaking the story. So I think that that's where I got the idea, but what like has kept me in it, why I'm still here amid the layoffs and the buyouts has been because when I was 15, I was a reporter for the high school newspaper and I started reporting on the, uh, the murders of women, of, of the murders of women across from my hometown in Ciudad Juarez, you know, the, the femicides, so more than 300 mis women had had gone missing at, at the time and the numbers you know some estimates were even higher that they they totaled that up to like you know 500 some 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 nonprofits totaled the, the, the tallies up to 500 so you know i think when when i met with the mothers of some of those women um you know one of them was eva Arce. she took me outside and she actually pointed to house after house after house where someone had lost a mother or a daughter or a sister um I, I I think there's just no coming back from that. Like you realize, like you have to do it. You like it, like this is it. It just um, it just like changes your life. You know, it like it, it makes you realize like um, these this could have been me. You know, these were these were women who were looked like me were uh, just born on the other side of the border, and I don't think I've ever wanted to do anything else. So we were 15 and you were suddenly covering atrocity. 
what's that like? Like how and where were you covering it for? How does how how does what? That, that's an amazing story. We ask this question to everybody who comes on the first time. Like, what got you into journalism? I think yours is definitely the best so far. So I kind of want. I was curious. Like, so who 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 are you covering it for? My high school newspaper. Oh I, wow. Yeah, yeah. I um. So I just uh, I did like a, a three part series and and on. You know, one was just like the overall look at the femicides and the different theories. And the second one was look, uh, speaking to a lawyer who um, had actually heard his son die on the phone. Uh, they were both lawyers and they were defending uh, bus drivers because uh, they believed they had evident they had reason to believe that they were being used as scapegoats by the government to be blamed uh, for um, the killings of some of the women. And you know, he, he, he was, he was targeted for that. And then the, the, the last story was actually speaking to the mothers of, of some of these women. And so that's, I think that's who I do it for, for Eva Arce, for Silvia Garcia, you know, for, for, for the, for women who we still don't know much about, or, you know, what, what became of them. What would you tell other journalists looking at covers for being really difficult like that about how to keep yourself together? You know, like how, like how, how do you unwind? Like what, what is the, do you have any any guidance for? Because that's that's really intense. <laughs> um, to unwind, like I, you know, I'm still kind of dealing with it. You know, <laughs> like right. I, yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I'm I'm from I'm from El Paso, so it's like a place where I don't know. I've, the violence doesn't really leave you. <laughs> so, wow, that's powerful. So. Last question, and we ask this of every first time guest. We ask it usually of every second time guest too. Who are the most underrated workers right now in the American newsroom? I um, I don't I don't wouldn't say that they're like underrated because I think they're but I don't I wouldn't say they're underrated, but I definitely admire all the reporters at the all the Latina immigration reporters at the LA Times. So Andrea Castillo, Brittany May, uh, uh, Cindy Carcamo, um, Paloma Esquivel, and she's she's more of an investigative reporter, but basically all the Latinas at the LA Times. <laughs> Esmeralda I love it. this. <laughs> Heck yeah, I love that. I love that. We love the LA Times, actually. Um, I became a subscriber to the LA Times um, when the Washington Post would not publish Latino opinions. I was like, okay, well, I'll cancel my Washington Post subscription. And I will subscribe to a publication that does actually publish Latinos, which is the LA Times. I think they're doing great work too. And Jasmine, thank you so much for coming on tonight on Meet La Prensa. Is there anything else you want to tell our audience before we go? No, no. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pleasure is all ours. So viewer, please make sure you like and subscribe to this video if you like what you're seeing here. And you can find Jasmine's Twitter handle right here in the description. Thanks for joining Meet La Prensa. That's a wrap. <laughs>